welcome to Hidden Treasures. My name is Luke and with my father here, Jim, again. We thank you for tuning in and uh, we've got a good show here with some good Bible stories we're going to read. And then my grandmother, Dorothy Morgan, uh, we're going to have an episode of her show, Gold Moments on Again, where she's going to read a, a story that uh, my father actually read a few weeks ago. And uh, she reads it really well. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, as always, subscribe at the bottom. Give us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I want you to stay tuned for it. Because when I read it, I was full of emotion. And of course, every time I read that story, I can never get through too much of it before it starts uh, really hitting me hard. I really liked the story. I had Mom read it to me a hundred times when I was a boy. You know, because it's the faith of a child that really touches the heart of God. So, um, I think we should cut to that short scene. It's only about eight minutes long. It's a really good story. And I didn't read it right the first time. So, um, that's what I think we can cut to very shortly. And then we'll come back and talk some more. Love it. Welcome to Golden Moments. Um, yes. I think I'm going to read a story for you uh, today out of a book I've had for some time. It's called I Believe in Miracles, and it's um, um, the stories are all true stories. And uh, some of you might remember when Catherine Kuhlman was uh, in ministry, and well, she died in '76, so it was previous to that. For a number of years, she was a great evangelist, and she uh, had a lot of healing in her ministry. So I'm going to read this one in, in this book, I Believe in Miracles. It's about a little girl, a four-year-old child. Her name is Amelia. And um, the story begins. The four-year-old child had just arrived home from the miracle service. Upon entering the house, she rushed up excitedly to the picture of the Last Supper. That's him, Grandma, she expla explained, pointing to the standing figure in the painting. That's Jesus. I saw him over at Miss Coleman's today. The small girl had been taken to the service that afternoon by her grandmother. One of the rare occasions that she had been taken out in public for many weeks, so appalling was her appearance. Some eight months before, little Amelia had awakened one morning with what appeared to be patches of a wet rash on her arms and legs. Before the week was out, her entire body was covered with running sores. The first doctor to whom she was taken diagnosed the trouble as eczema. He prescribed treatment, but her condition continued to worsen. As the days went on, the sores began to bleed badly, and her whole body had to be encased in cloths. No, no water could touch her, and she was cleansed as gently as possible with oil. Her arms were wrapped in bandages, and unable to bend them, they hung straight at the child's side. As her grandmother says, her whole skin was cracked open. Blood and pus constantly oozed out. She was in continual pain, and it was torture for her to have the ch dressings changed. She screamed if anyone came near her. It grew impossible to comb her hair. So covered with sores was her scalp. She had no eyebrows whatever, and her eyelids had been eaten away with sores. Her ears were actually rotting away and one ear seemed literally to be falling off, so devoured it was by disease. <coughs> In the early stages of her disease, she had been able to play with other children, but now her appearance revolted them, and not only did they shun her, they were not allowed by their parents to visit her. Before her face and head became so badly ravaged, her mother had tried to take her on a streetcar, but even then no one would sit beside her and were reluctant to use even the seats adjacent to her. Young as she was, Amelia was pathetically conscious of the horror she engendered in others. She did not know why people stared, then turned away with that expression in her eyes that she did not understand. It made her intensely unhappy. She would often cry and say to her mother, 
Why doesn't anyone like me? Until the time came that she was virtually never taken out of the house. As long as she was able, she played around in her own home. When her mother let her help with the household chores to keep her occupied, she was pleased and proud. But even this had to be stopped as it became increasingly painful for the child to move and impossible for her to bend her arm. Doctor after doctor was consulted. They disagreed on diagnosis, but were in unanimous agreement on one point. Whatever the malady was, it was the worst skin ailment they had ever encountered in their practice of medicine. Finally, one of the physicians on the case suggested to the family that a nearly be taken to the cancer clinic. Her grandmother had said to him that day, prayer helps too, and the doctor had nodded. It was at this point, while awaiting an appointment at the clinic, that Grandma gave voice to a desire she had long felt. She asked permission of the child's mother to take Amelia to one of Miss Toulman's services. A devout Roman Catholic, Catholic, as was the entire family, the grandmother had become interested in the Kuhlman ministry through the radio broadcast. She had herself attended several services at which she felt she had been greatly helped. Amelia's mother not only granted permission to take the child, but also agreed to pray at home during the hours of the service on the following day. The little girl had been brought up in a religious household, and she was a child of simple and complete faith in our Lord and his ability to perform miracles. She went to the service that afternoon as the faithful go to the Lord, confident and expected that she would be healed so that she would not hurt any more and could play once more with her little friends, so that she could again go places with her mother and ride on streetcars and people would smile and want to sit beside her and not turn away with funny expressions on their faces. But above all, as she confided to her grandmother, I want to see Jesus. When I asked my son to drive us to the service, the grandmother told me later, he demurred. You can't possibly take her into a crowd of people looking as she does, he said. But I replied, certainly I can. That is what this place is for. They won't mind. But Amelia's uncle was not so sure. He waited outside for them just in case. Once inside the auditorium, even Grandma sought to cover the child's head as best she could with her coat so that those who saw her wouldn't be frightened. For, as she recalled, her skin was now so badly cracked that you could lay a pin in each crevice. The scanty hair that remained on her head was stuck tight to her scalp and her ears just hung as though they were both ready to drop off. Amelia and her grandmother took their seats that afternoon in the rear of the auditorium, both totally unknown to me. During the singing toward the end of the service, Amelia poked her grandmother. Look, Grandma, she explained in loud tones. I see Jesus up there. Where? Her grandmother whispered. Heads turned in the auditorium as the child said, Up there, at the side of Miss Coleman. Look at him. Jesus up there. And see, he has his hands out. Her grandmother looked down at Amelia, and then she looked again, and her heart began to pound. The sores on the little girl's face were entirely dried up. There was no evidence of blood or pus anywhere to be seen. Her heart overflowed with joy and thanksgiving. When they left the auditorium, Amelia's uncle was waiting for them. He took one look at the little girl and nearly fainted. When we got home, reports the grandmother, she couldn't wait to tell everyone what had happened. The thing she told was how she had seen Jesus. The thing her family saw was how her sores were all dried up. Her father took one look and cried, a miracle. I said nothing to anyone. I just wanted to make sure that everything was all right before I said anything about it. The following week, Amelia was again taken to the auditorium. In the middle of the service, the scabs covering her face and head and body began to drop off. They came off her like snow falling, her grandmother said, and I was embarrassed, for they fell all over some lady's clothes. But most of all, I was thankful, and the whole time I was praising the Lord. Thus was Amelia completely and permanently healed. She was grateful to Jesus from the bottom of her little heart, but she was not at all surprised, for she had known all along that he could and would perform the miracle. The little girl's skin was now flawless. There was no sign of a sore, no indication of a scab, no marks of any scarring. Within a short time, her washed and combed hair made a golden halo around her radiant little face. 
Her eyebrows became full and well marked. Her eyelids and the ears were fully restored. One thousand people saw the condition of this child and witnessed her healing, which the doctors call a miracle. Amelia's case has moved me as much as anything that has ever happened in this ministry, and not solely because of the physical healing, of which I have seen so many equally remarkable, but because of her unquestioning faith, her unswerving certainty of the reality of the vision she had had of Jesus, and the tenacity with which she has clung over the seven years since her healing to her original story. In the beginning, friends and neighbors, although they could not deny the healing, either accused the child of making up the story or accused the grandmother of putting the idea into the child's head. Her mother and father were at first convinced that the whole thing had been a product of a child's overactive imagination. They talked to her at length and questioned her closely, but nothing they could say could shake her insistence that she had indeed seen the Lord. She still comes off into the services, and from time to time, I, too, have closely questioned her. Did you really see Jesus, I asked again, only recently, of the radiant, lovely-looking 11-year-old girl she has become? Clear and firm, came the reply. Yes. And where was he? He was standing right over there by you. What did he look like, I queried once again. Like the picture of the sacred heart, and his arms were outstretched, she said. Are you positive you saw him? Her face aglow, she answered, Oh, yes, it is the realest thing in my whole life. How long did he stand there? At least five or ten minutes, came her reply. Long after the singing had stopped and you had finished your prayer. She smiled then as she said, Oh, Miss Coolman, I'll never forget it as long as I live. The experience of this little girl was clearly not imagination or an hallucination or a delusion, but a true vision. To a tiny face filled filled child of four who wanted more than anything in the world to see her Savior, Jesus had revealed himself. To those who persist in believing that it is my faith which in some way which is in some way responsible for the miracles occurring under this ministry, and that my prayers carry more weight than the prayers of others, I offer Amelia's case as only one among many in refutation of this totally mistaken notion. I point out that at the time of the child's healing, I did not even know that the child was at the service and therefore did not offer a special prayer for her. I did not see her until after she had received her healing when I heard a voice ejaculate, Look, Grandma, I see Jesus up there. It was only then that I ran my eyes quickly over the auditorium to determine where that small but penetrating voice was coming from and finally saw in the arms of some woman a little girl gesticulating in my direction. It was through the prayers of this child, not mine, that the power of God was released. And it was in response to the simple faith of a little child, not mine, that Jesus laid his hand upon her small body. I pray with everything within me that no one shall ever see Catherine Kuhlman in this <coughs> ministry, but only the Holy Spirit. It's a prayer. Dear God, give us the simple faith that little children know, the faith to believe in the living person and power of Jesus, the faith to look for miracles upon this earth below. For if we wear this simple faith wrapped like a cloak around us, we will be blessed as children are. And it is then that we will not only know about life, we will know how to live life. Well, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that reading. Uh, so my father is now going to read a, uh, a verse from the Bible. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's uh, got a good one here picked out, I think. Yeah, it's about treasures in heaven. And, of course, this uh, whole program is called Hidden Treasures. And uh, what we need to do is search the scriptures for all the hidden treasures and wisdom. So this one is in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 19 to 24. And I think that we can find uh, some good advice in here. So I'll just go ahead and read it and then we'll discuss it later. Okay. Okay. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust uh, destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up you, uh, for yourselves treasures in heaven where the moth and rust do not destroy, 
than where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? For no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will de be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And see, that there is telling us where our treasure should be. What do you think? I agree. I think that, you know, you can have all the wealth in the world and still not be rich. And still be poor at heart. You know, I mean, I have a lot of fancy things here, but I consider myself to be one of the most wealthiest people in the world. Now, why do you figure that? Because I got a beautiful family. Uh-huh. I got a bride with me. Uh -huh. Nothing more I need. I have everything I need. Both in love and in spirit. Yeah, so you consider money not to be an essential part of life. No, it's not. Absolutely not. You you can you can get through life without money. I mean, you can't really get through society without money in some form or another, but you can find happiness without money. Yeah. You see, it's the love of money. It's the fact that it's the love of money which leads to all evil. It is the root of iniquity. So it's okay to have lots of money as long as that's not where your heart is. Absolutely. Because the richest man in the world can afford to have salvation. The richest man in the world does not mean that you have possessions, that you have good clothes, lots of fancy cars. Some of the happiest people in the world can home thinking, thinking of I have one of the happiest people in the world and the wealthiest people in the world. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, I agree with that, but I mean, it's nice to be clean, you know, at least you have a bath. Well, you gotta clean yourself as well, of course, but absolutely, I 100% agree with it, that wealth, true wealth, is not in the dollar. No. That's why I got another little story here to read you. Now, it's a simple story, and it's a very true one. And, um, you know, it's called uh, Jesus is Jim. Now, that has nothing to do with me, <laughs> and it's not about me, okay? Amy James. All right. I like the name Jim. But anyways, I think you'll like this story. It's a very short story. And it teaches that this uh, man... Is the wealthiest man on earth. If you listen to the story and you truly understand it. Uh, so we'll start. This is what it's called. Jesus is Jim. Jim is Jesus. And um, maybe I'll get you to read it because yeah, you have better vocabulary than me. Alright. So Jesus is Jim, a true story. The preacher puzzled face on his, a puzzled frown on his face. Oh, I messed that one up. Hurried to the cottage where the church caretaker lived. I am worried, he explained. Every day at twelve o'clock, a shabby old man goes into the church. I can see him through the parsonage window, which I believe is the yes, the Gavin Hood window. He only stays for a few minutes. It seems the most it seems most mysterious, and you know the altar furnishings are quite valuable. I wish you would keep an eye open. Well, the next day, and so for long days, the caretaker watched. And, sh and sure enough, at 12 o'clock, the shabby figure would arrive. One day, the caretaker accosted him. Look here, my friend. What are you up to? Going into the church every day. 
I go to pray, the old man replied quietly. Now come, the curate took his head sternly. You don't stay long enough to pray. You're only there a few minutes, for I have watched you. You go just go up to the altar every day and then come away. Yes, that's true. I cannot pray a long prayer. But every day at 12, I just comes and says, Jesus is Jim. And then I wait a minute. And then comes away. He's definitely from Newfoundland. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little prayer, but I guess he hears me. Sometime later, poor old Jim went and was taken to the city hospital where he settled down quietly and happily while his wife mended. The ward where Jim lay the ward. The ward where Jim lay had been a sore spot for the hospital nurses for a long time. Some of the men were cross and miserable. Others did nothing but grumble and grumble from morning till night. Try as the nurses would, the men did not care. And then slowly but surely things changed. The men stopped grumbling. They took their medicine. They ate their food. And they settled down without a single complaint. We should all be so lucky. Yeah. One day, hearing a burst of happy laughter, the nurse asked, What to you all? You are, such a, you, are, you are such a nice, cheerful lot of patients. Where have all the grumps gone? I said, Oh, it's old. He's always so happy, never complains, although we know he must have a lot to pay. He makes us ashamed to murmur when Jim is about. He's always so cheerful. The nurse crossed over where Jim lay. His silver, silvery gray hair gave him an angelic look. His quiet eyes were full of peace. The men say you are responsible for the change in the world. That you are always happy. I nurse, that I am. I can't help being happy. The senior nurse looks my visitor. Every day he makes me happy. Your visitor? The nurse was puzzled. She'd always noticed that Jim's chair was empty on visiting days, for he was a lonely old man without any relatives. Your visitor, she repeated. But when does he come? Every day, Jim replied, with light in his eyes. Yes, every day at 12 o'clock, he comes and stands at the foot of my bed. I see him, and he smiles and says, Jim is Jesus. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. I looked upon him and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord had heard him. Saved him out of all his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encompassed around them. They fear him and deliver him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who that's from Psalms 34, 4, verse, verse 4 to 8. And he said unto me, My grace sufficient for thee. Whatever that My means. grace is sufficient. Oh, sufficient. That's why. For thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather I will I rather glory in the infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's from 2 Corinthians. Chapter 12, verse 9. Infirmities, but anyway. Infirmities. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and times of refreshing shall come to the presence of the Lord. Now that one's from Acts 3.19. Lots of, I like that. I, always, I remember that reading that story. It was a neat little story. Well, in the oncoming weeks, um, there's a couple talk about and that's if uh, we get the proper response so it's important that you tell us what you think of our program and how you are enjoying it or you don't like it but there's two subjects I would like to talk about and one is how to have victory over sin and it's written by Floyd McClung and the other one which is also written by Floyd, is intimacy. Now these are two subjects I'd like to cover and like to do with you in an in-depth study of how we can have victory over sin and what sin really is. 
And uh, where is the treasure that goes along with it? And that's what we're going to find in the Bible. You have to read every day. You should always open your Bible every day because you can always find inspiration hidden within. Even the simplest line. Yeah, if you're feeling really lost, you think that the world is against you, I would encourage you to read Psalm 139. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it says, but I want you to look it up yourself and read it. And then if you have questions about it, give us a little comment. But it's important, that psalm is important because it tells you how God views us. And, uh, yeah, you need to look that up. Well, thanks for tuning in. And, again, we're going to say a little prayer before we go. But, again, remember to subscribe at the bottom and leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. So we're, we're just going to close with a small prayer. And, and uh, we thank you for tuning in. Yeah, you go ahead. Well, Lord, we come before you with all our viewers. We pray that you'd be with them every day as they walk through life and help them find the, the victory in you and the victory over sin, Lord. Be with them this week as they go through their daily lives and encourage them, Lord, and give them blessing. We thank you for all your blessings. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in. See you next week.